Hi, uh, my name is Greg Howard, and thanks to the folks at Meekling Press, I'm here to talk about objects and fragments and magic. Um, tonight, I'm going to be reading uh, from an essay that I wrote called uh, The Object is Always Magic, Narrative is Collection. Um, and I'm going to be interspersing uh, with that um, excerpts from uh, my novel Hospice, which uh, just came out and which was written kind of as I wrote the essay or the essay is about the book and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between them. So I'm going to start uh, just by reading the essay. <clears throat> Some years ago I found myself in the British Museum. My family was on vacation for my father's 70th birthday. We were on our way to Ireland where my father would get to golf and the rest of us would get to be tourists. I was, in a sense, just passing through. After wandering the galleries for several hours, and just before I was to meet up with my mother and sister, I came upon a small exhibit entitled Medicine Man, the Forgotten Museum of Henry Welcome. Having long been interested in medical histories, especially failed knowledge and deliberate quackery, and having long been a lover of museums for their transmission of the pleasurable sense of encountering the arcane, I was immediately drawn in. And it's safe to say I had no idea what I was about to see. In the room, small by the standards of uh, any museum, but the British Museum uh, in particular, which is huge, um, all manner of strange and diversion objects were on display. There was a male chastity belt, artificial noses made of gold and silver and ivory, glass eyes in rows and real eyes in jars, artificial hands made of metal, other artificial hands made of ivory, a variety of artificial legs, various anatomical dolls, and phrenological heads. There were advertisements for treatments and medicines, public health posters warning of a variety of diseases, painted depictions of medical techniques and surgeries, and a coterie of shamanistic amulets, votive candles, and death masks. I walked through the exhibit with a sense of awe, delight, and a little bit of confusion. It was this magical space that opened up in a space that I thought I knew, a place that I was kind of expecting to be one thing, and it became this other thing entirely. Uh, and it totally altered my perception uh, of the museum and for the rest of the day. So this wasn't my first encounter with this kind of thing. Years earlier, let's say about 10, I bought five Victorian eyeballs at an antique sale outside of Harvard Square in Boston, Massachusetts, where I was living at the time. Each eyeball, the antique dealer told me, had been made specifically for a client, the perfect match to correspond with the client's real eyes. They were hazel and blue and green and light brown, and some of them had art artfully constructed red veins in the sclera in order to enhance, enhance the realism of the eye. You can see there's one right there. And you can see here, if I hold this up, you maybe even see the red veins. There's that guy. And some more red veins there. Beautiful. There's a nice blue looking one like that. Uh, they had been found, all of them, like a hundred of them, the dealer said, in an old optometrist shop that had been burned down. The eyeballs were the only thing to survive the fire. As the dealer told me this, I held these eyeballs in my hand, which I can do now. Uh, and felt a particular weight. They kind of feel like a marble and admired their beauty um, and thought about the people that they were intended for. Why didn't they pick up the eye? Did something tragic happen to them before they were able? Did they fall out the window? Were they shot by a jealous lover, a jealous spouse? Did they lose all their money before it was time to pay for their eyeball? What does a fake eye say about a person anyway? What story can it tell? In his novel Immortality, Milan Kundra, creates an entire book out of a gesture. The narrator, a writer named Milan Kundera, witnesses at the pool of his health club. A middle-aged woman, having finished a difficult swimming lesson, turns back and smiles and waves. This gesture, the narrator tells us, belongs to that of a young girl. The narrator is fascinated by this discrepancy. Who is this woman, he wants to know. The essence of her charm, he states, independent of time, revealed itself to me for a second in that gesture and dazzled me. 
I was strangely moved. And then the word Agnes entered my mind. Agnes, I have never known a woman by that name. The lesson here is this. Stories come from fragments and from ellipsis. I'm going to read the first part of hospice. Uh, there's a preface section, and then I'm going to read the first section. It's a book that's written in small fragmented sections. By the side of a road, the boy and girl are playing. The road goes on for miles in either direction. No houses are visible, no buildings at all. It is just the road, the road, the meadow, the woods, and then in the distance, the sea, the smell of it. The boy and girl each have wispy mud-colored hair of equal length. If not for a slight height difference, they might be identical, interchangeable. The girl has a sharp rock in her left hand. She places the tip against her brother's forehead, right between the eyes. Okay, she says. This is going to pinch a little. Get it out, he says. Just get it out. She begins to push the rock into his flesh. Wait, he says. She pulls the rock away and fixes him with her eyes. She forgot to say, in case of accidental death, is there anything I wish to express to my loved ones? She looks at him for a moment. He is serious, concerned. She rubs the rock with her thumb and forefinger, caresses it. In case of accidental death, she says, her voice calm. Is there anything you wish to express to your loved ones? He looks down for a moment, as if considering the dirt. In the woods around them, birds skitter and call. No, he says finally. She quickly thrusts the rock into his head. Blood trickles down the bridge of his nose. She steps back and peers into her hands. Well, he says with a concerned look, her hands open to reveal a small violet. His face is transformed. I told you so, he says triumphantly. We're also collecting cats today. She hands him a flower in the rock. Now it's my turn, she says, smiling. Part one. Then she found herself caring for the memory of an old woman's dog. Of course, this wasn't how Lucy first understood the position. It seemed at first like any other job. She went out in the afternoon, the woman said, as she led Lucy from room to room to run errands and occasionally play some bridge and needed someone to look after her dog, Popsicle. It wasn't really much trouble now that he was getting on. The job was easy. Feed Popsicle at three and let him out in the backyard afterwards to do his business. That was it. That was the whole job. The food was kept in an opaque, opaque plastic bin underneath the sink, the treats in a shiny blue jar with the word woof inscribed in wobbly black letters. There was a number four, God forbid, the emergency vet, and the thermostat had to be kept at 70 degrees at all times. It helps with popsicles bones, the woman said, the corners of her mouth curled with delicate sadness. While the woman talked, Lucy looked around for the dog. Every time they entered a room, she expected to find him there waiting for them, but each room was empty, dogless. The house was dim, darkened against the afternoon's insistent light by dusty blinds, but it was also small. Realistically, there weren't many places for a dog to hide, especially the dog the size of Popsicle, because Popsicle, it turned out, was a fat brown lab with a square head and an enthusiastic, bewildered countenance. There were pictures of him everywhere, on every wall, in every desk, on every bureau, and every table, there he was, looking happy and maybe a little bit deranged. In quite a few of the pictures, he wore unimaginative holiday outfits. Popsicle, the joyful elf, the bow-tied rabbit, the kindly witch. A dog, like, a dog like that, she thought, would be hard to miss. Certainly, he wouldn't be cowering behind the credenza. It seemed to her as if that very instant Popsicle should be bounding around them disruptively, or at least following them absently with a slight and amiable wag of his tail. But the whole house was quiet. The whole house was still. The situation, Lucy felt, was both curious and a little bit alarming. She had found the job through a website that specialized in local animal needs. Here, as everywhere, there was a lot of need. On the website, 
Uh, people bought and sold animals. They solicited advice. They considered counsel. They reverently described their own animals' wonderful idiosyncratic behavior. They posted pictures with funny captions. It was a community dedicated to the holy mysteries of animal companionship, and so the people who hung out there, while mostly sincere and kind-hearted, tended to be more than a little bit erratic. Like once, for example, she was answering an ad to care for a sweet and loving bulldog from a woman who called herself Nancy. When she arrived at Nancy's house, however, she found herself watching a pit bull eat the foam out of an old orange couch. That's not a bulldog, she said. My precious little buster, Nancy said. Don't be ridiculous. For one, Lucy said, a bulldog is smaller, I think. Are you calling me a liar, Nancy said. Are you calling Buster a liar? He has papers. He has credentials. I'm okay with it, she said. I can still take care of him. I just want to be on the same page. Nancy paced in circles and wrung her hands while Buster continued with the couch. You're sick, Nancy hissed. You're one of those. We don't need you. Buster doesn't need you. Isn't that right, she asked the dog. Little Buster Man. This was typical, Lucy thought later. People wanted animals, but they didn't really know what to do with them. They considered them, but only on their own terms. He's a sleeper, the old woman was saying, a cuddler. The tour had ended and they were back in the living room. The old woman was buttoning up her tan Macintosh and pulling on thin cotton gloves. Popsicle had still failed to appear, but this didn't seem to perturb the woman much at all. She was getting ready to go. She had places to be. Occasionally, he can be a little fussy, the woman said. She smoothed out her coat and grabbed her handbag. But if you don't look at him directly in the eyes, she continued, you should do just fine. Lucy glanced around the room. She was sure now that at last the dog would materialize. He would arrive with haste to salute his departing mistress, to offer up a bit of himself, memory, image, animal soul, for his owner to carry forward like armor into the day's dull assault. The woman adjusted her gloves. She applied some lipstick. Still no popsicle. With the dog neglecting even this basic duty, Lucy really didn't know what to think. Maybe she decided he was in the backyard or napping in a closet. Maybe he was underneath a bush somewhere, gnawing on a rotten branch. She felt for a moment a little giddy about what would unfold after the woman had left and shut the door behind her, as if all the oxygen had been momentarily sucked from the room, as if she were about to leap from the high wall of a quarry into the cool blackness of whatever lurked below. Then, at the front door, just before her exit, the old woman turned to the empty couch and waved at it. Goodbye, Popsicle, the woman said with tender enthusiasm. That was when Lucy realized what her duties really were. The same time I got the glass eyeballs, I was collecting junk. Let's see that. I have no idea what it is, but I've kept it for about 15 years. Mostly I was collecting rusted scrap metal I found on the street, small bits, big chunks, anything that caught my eye. I would pick it up and bring it back to my room and put it in piles. All over my room there were these piles. I imagined I would learn how to solder and create something wonderful from the culture's distritus the bits sloughed off and are delirious and impatient, constant rebirthing. I put the metal in piles and put the piles in boxes. I took them with me everywhere for years and years, boxes and boxes. I never learned how to solder and I didn't create anything, yet I still corrected, collected this scrap metal. I kept it and cherished it. And maybe it seems useless, but I don't think what I was doing was useless in collecting this. Uh, I think what I was doing was learning how to be, become a writer. When I was little, I didn't collect anything. I tried to collect baseball cards, but I couldn't bring myself to care about baseball cards. When my friends cared about baseball cards. I could not care at all about baseball cards. Uh, I tried stamps and coins and the little spoons with state names on them, but I didn't care about them either. I thought I should be collecting something, but I didn't know what to collect or why. Until I started writing, it was very organized. My room was always clean and all of my stuff was meticulously placed. Everything had a proper place. Once I started writing, once I began to think of myself as a writer and to write my first short stories, my rooms got messier and messier. I kept bringing in junk, scrap metal, an old window, broken toys, a rusty saw. I tried to find the saw, it's somewhere in the house, but I, I can't remember where it was. Uh, I kept putting these things I already had in the wrong place. 
leaving them where they weren't supposed to be. In chapter 33 of George Perec's Life, a user's manual, Perec presents two sellers, the Altamonts and the Gratioles. The Altamont seller is described as neat and tidy and clean. What follows this description is a long list of objects. It's just a list. In contrast, the next seller, the Gratiolet seller, is described as basically a rubbish heap. Here, instead of a list, Perec contextualizes each object. We find out that an old typewriter was used by Francois Gratiolet to create invoices when the factory they owned decided to modernize. That an old overcoat worn by Olivier Gratiolet after he was taken prisoner in 1940 and was kept until he was released in 1942. We are able to peruse a box of curling photographs and are told all about different family members appearing in each photo. Almost every object in that dingy, disorganized space comes with a story. The lesson is this. Stories come from mess and unexpected juxtaposition. This is from Hospice. The night she was supposed to take Marinella to see the men, the girls finally invited her to dinner. They sat at a long wooden table under dim swaying lights and passed food. Their faces looked sharp and expectant. For an occasion of this order, special plates were required. The plates were kept somewhere in the basement where no one ever went. A girl took her by the hand and led her there. The basement was cool and damp and soft. Sagging boxers were scattered across the floor. There was a camera tripod facing a dirty brown couch against the wall. There was a dresser with drawers pulled out and clothes hanging out of them. Together, they knelt in front of a box, she and the girl. Lucy removed things one by one and placed them beside her. The girl shoved her hands in and pushed them around. She pulled out a photograph in a rusty metal frame. The photo was black and white and showed two women standing next to each other, almost holding hands. They might have been twins, but there was something off about them. They both had boyish haircuts and looked stern. The girl wordlessly showed the pictures to Lucy, holding it delicately for a few moments, but then suddenly she tossed it aside and plunged her hands back into the box. After a few more moments of searching, the girl began to tell her about how, when she was 13, she had tried to kill herself. She started just talking out of the blue. What she remembered, the girl said, is that she tried to hang herself from the ceiling of her parents from the ceiling fan in her parents' bedroom. It was afternoon and the room was dark. On the bed she had placed her stuffed animals and dolls to watch. She tested several times using a stepladder. She pulled up her legs to see if the fan would hold and then how long it would take before she began to lose consciousness. Finally, she jumped. Obviously, she didn't die. Her mother found her in time, though it took her a while to revive her. At least this is what her mother told her when she talked about the incident, which is what her, mo which is what her mother called it, the attempt. I was at the supermarket looking at cans of soup, she would say, and it suddenly occurred to me that had I made more often those chicken enchiladas you love so much and were always requesting, I might have averted the incident. She would also leave little notes on the girl's pillow or on napkins in her school lunch. Thinking about you, the note said, and the incident. In this way, the story slowly became her mother's. Soon, she hardly recognized herself. You were always an unhappy child, her mother said, morose and strange. You like to pretend to die. In the pine trees behind the house, you'd imagine yourself attacked by poisonous spiders. She didn't remember the pine trees or the spiders, and now she was having trouble with the suicide, not the act. She could remember standing there, ready looking, uh, ready, looking at her dolls and animals, their unforgiving eyes, but what she couldn't remember is why. Maybe she thought she was playing a death game, or maybe she really was unhappy, even though she didn't feel unhappy, or remember feeling unhappy. One day she took all of her clothes and books and stuffed animals and burned them in a bonfire in the backyard. Then she left. It wasn't until she ended up here that, that things began to make some sense to her. Wow, Lucy said. Yeah, the girl said. Mother, she said. Yeah, the girl said. Should I get the plates, she asked. They're already upstairs, the girl said. At dinner, all the girls 
placed forks delicately into their mouths at regular intervals. At the center of a, the table, a gray freshwater fish with gelatinous eyes offered up its torn body. The girl who had taken her to the basement stood behind her and poured something into the, her cup. Inside of it, the liquid looked black. Lucy could see, if barely, bits of her reflection there. Will you drink the water? The girl asked. Everyone looked at her. Let me tell you one last different story about the exact same thing. At the same time I was collecting junk, I was also collecting rubber bands. Like the scrap metal I found, I do found them on the street I wore. The rubber bands around my wrists like bangles. Every time I saw one, I picked it up and put it on. And this went on for months. Soon I could not pick one up. If I walked past a rubber band and neglected to pick it up, I would begin to get nervous. I would get, start to get hot and start to sweat. My chest would get tight and I would get a lump in my throat. Eventually, I would just turn around and pick the rubber band back up. This is my editor. A year or so later, what I can only describe as a I had, can, I had what I can only describe as a protracted nervous breakdown. I began to believe that I was dying. My death took many forms. First, I had a brain tumor. I knew this because I had constant headaches and started dropping things and had trouble articulating my thoughts. These are all the symptoms of acute anxiety. My tumor soon moved. At various times, I had lymphoma, rectal cancer, colon cancer. That year, I collected symptoms like rubber bands. I racked up hundreds and hundreds of doctor and hospital bills. I spent New Year's Eve on the phone uh, with the emergency room talking about my brain tumor. I bought a book of self-diagnosis and read it over and over again, learning about all the new diseases I had. Did you know that an excessive sweating is a symptom of cancer? Did you know that unexplained persistent itching is also a symptom of cancer? You'll never guess what these disorders also express. What this, this you'll never guess what disorder these symptoms also express. What I'm talking about here is obsession. The Oxford English Dictionary tells me that a rare or obscure meaning of obsess is to be haunted or possessed by an evil spirit. The secondary definition of obsession is the supposed action of an evil spirit in besetting a person. The primary definition of both obsess and obsession revolve, revolves around the idea of the siege, obsess, to besiege, obsession, the act of besieging. Etymologically, though, the word involves sitting, obsidere, to sit facing or before. When I sit facing the television, I can watch people who have collected so many things that their homes have become unlivable. These people can't stop collecting. They must fill their physical space with clothes or art or teddy bears or canned goods or any combination of these things you can imagine. What is it, I think to myself, that's haunting these people? Why must their spaces be compulsively filled? Much like an old-fashioned freak show, I'm supposed to watch these people and feel better about my own life, but what I see is a reflection in a funhouse mirror. In an interview with Robert Gluck, Dennis Cooper has this to say about obsession. What I write has such an intense hold on me, and it seems, um, so, too inappropri it seems so inappropriate to the world I live in that it's left me deeply confused and split. My life and my work have been trying to figure out how to negotiate between my internal world and my external world. If I have any authority, it derives from the kind of obsessive focus on building a craft that will get me close to human, as close as humanly possible to these things that would destroy me if I didn't have language to protect me. Look closely at what happens in Cooper's answer. He has these things that obsess him, that have a hold over him, that haunt and besiege him. Writing is a way of relating to these things. But not just any kind of writing. Not free writing or journaling. He builds a craft in order to get close to these things, but not too close. He creates form and structure so as to contain them. He does this over and over, obsessively, he says. He transfers his obsession to the act and craft of writing itself. That evening when Lucy returned home, the girls were holding a seance in her room. The girls were this group of young women who lived with her in this big, sagging Victorian. The house had many rooms, and each room contained one of the girls. They looked the same and dressed the same and spoke to each other in soft words that were sometimes hard to understand. For fun sometimes, they would put on puppet shows in a large circular den on the first floor. The puppet show was always the same. In it, a man was walking with confidence through a haunted wood. He was redoubtable. 
in his bearing and choice of costume. These woods did not scare him. After all, he was a man who'd walked through other woods, through deeper and darker and more haunted woods. In other words, he was a man of purpose. And because his purpose lay beyond these woods, the trees around him as he walked became to him nothing more than background, as if he was not in the forest at all, as if the trees had been painted hastily on a flimsy canvas. He walked and walked. But then suddenly he stopped. He stopped in front of a tree, and from it broke a thin branch. He stripped the branch and waved it in front of him with pleasure, listening to it whip through the air. Why did he do this? The branch was too small to be a walking stick, and he had no need of a switch. He caressed it gently, this lovely branch, and his gentleness resembled a kind of desperate pawing. But then, just as quickly as he had procured the branch, he dropped it, and without a backward glance, continued on his way. The sound of the woods was pleasant to him now, the light gentle, alluring. His journey now felt as if it were nothing more than an afternoon ramble. Later there would be tea and small sandwiches. But meanwhile, unbeknownst to him, inside the trunk of the now mutilated tree, the now mutilated woman he once loved cried out in anguish. He had wounded her once again. She had come to him, transformed in his hour of direst need, but all he can do is wound. Why hadn't she foreseen this? The man continued gamely on. He whistled. He left the woods and found himself another landscape, another object to desire. It was only after he was far from the forest that the tree began to bleed. Lucy wasn't supposed to see these shows, and she knew she wasn't supposed to see them because the girls would stop talking when she passed them in the hallway. But she watched anyway. She sat on the stairs and watched the puppets move in discordant jumps like something was chewing on their nerves. They had waxen, implacable faces. They seemed sinister. Tonight, though, they were in her room. The girls. They were sitting in a kind of oblong circle amongst the smattering of candles and whispers. They were talking to the dead. Oh, one said, after Lucia had walked through the door, we thought you'd gone to visit your family. My family, Lucy said. Or a faraway friend, the girl offered. What are you talking about, Lucy said. For a while, they looked at each other, she and everyone else, with slight mutual suspicion. Things have gone missing from the house, someone said. Little things, knives, drinking glasses, shoes, those kind of things. We consider our options in a seance seem the best course of action. You decided to do it here, Lucy said, in my room. Cardinal points are important, the girl said. She had a book and held it in front of her with an air of solemn authority. Oh, she said. I thought we were doing an exorcism, one said. As if, another said. You don't expel something before a certainty can be established, the girl with the book responded. Yeah, the girl next to her chimed in. I mean, what if it's friendly? I don't know. Is there such a thing? Like, would they return if they were benevolent? Do benevolent things come back? Do benevolent things come back, someone said, in diminishing mocking tones. Don't be a bitch, someone else said. They don't return, another explained. They just don't want you to leave. Even when you want them to, they don't get that you want them to. I lived in a place with one once, one girl said softly. I would come home and find the appliances going. A different one each time. Like one day the blender and the next the coffee maker. How lovely. It's like it was greeting you, like it was telling you it was happy to see you. That's a bit naive, don't you think? The landlord came over and looked at the wiring and said everything was just fine. Nothing is ever wrong with the wiring. There's never anything wrong with the wiring, he said. He was sad about it. It turned out that this has been happening for a while, ever since his grandmother died in the apartment, died right there in the kitchen. Shouldn't they have to, like, tell you that when you're looking at the place? I think that's something you should know. Listen, said the girl with the book. She died out of loneliness, the grandmother. Or at least, that's what the landlord thought. He'd lived there and had taken care of her as long as he could, and when he couldn't anymore, when his grandmother had become so sick that she required professional care, he bought the place next door and moved there. He had a wife and child, he said. They needed the space. They needed a life of their own. And he could still be the same person he always was, just right next door. 
but the grandmother thought it was a terrible slight, unforgivable, didn't talk to him ever again. He would knock on her door and she would stand there and not answer. He could hear her wheezing through the door. She wasn't a hard woman, he said, just scared. His mother had left them both to fend for themselves, just ran off one day with a blackjack dealer. And he was all she had and he wasn't enough. Later, his mother came back and lived there for a while, but then she died too. But he knew the ghost was his grandmother. He could feel her in her anger and her love. His mother hadn't liked it enough to stay the first time. Why would she stay now? Plus, anyway, he said that the time had passed for people to be ghosts. Now, after death, they were just fleeting thoughts. That's fucked up. I don't know. I think it's kind of beautiful. I guess people are as unforgiving in death as they are in life, said Lucy. No one looked at her. It was nice, the girl said, telling us telling the story said it was nice to feel like i wasn't alone but now you have us listen someone pleaded are we going to do this why not another said everyone held hands come on a girl said now that you're here you have to be apart lucy sat down and entered the circle a girl on each side of her took her hand their hands were cool and smooth the girl with the book told them to empty their minds Lucy tried to empty her mind, but it didn't seem to work. Okay, spirit, the girl with the book said. We know you're there and we know what you've been doing. Is it a good idea to talk to, like, to it like that? I think you're supposed to say, oh, spirit, otherwise it won't respond. Shh, someone admonished. Oh, spirit, someone said. Shh, listen, we don't want to hurt you. We don't even want to know who you are or why you're here. Honestly, we don't care. We just want you to stop taking our things, stop taking them and putting them in strange places. And stop inhabiting our rooms, we're not there, one chimed in. We're not unreasonable, the girl with the book said. We're willing to compromise. Lucy imagined the spirit there, listening, silent and bemused. Were ghosts logical? Could they be reasoned with? Or were they more like animals? Like silent animals, watching and waiting. To her, they seemed more like animals. Does anyone feel cold? The girl with the book asked. We'll know it's here if we feel cold. But no one did, not especially. Later, when it was just her in the room, she wondered what had happened if they had done it right. She wondered if they had done it right, and, and if they hadn't, what would happen? Night after night, she would sit in her room and look at the walls. Now I have you is what she would think. So uh, one of the things I learned from writing this essay as I was writing this book um, is that what I was interested in in thinking about writing this collection is uh, not just the process, and there's a lot. You can see um, some relationship between um, some of the stuff in that I experienced in my own kind of obsessions and desire to, to collect things um, and images that appear in the book. Um, but also that primary experience of discovering um, the welcome collection uh, and all the objects and all the stories that the objects hold kind of ended up being uh, an experience that happens again and again in hospice um, where I'm always intrigued by a space that opens up, that's kind of a magical provisional space and story is created and then um, it closes down again. And uh, I was interested in writing um, and thinking about it and creating a book that was kind of an engine for stories like an architecture, uh, a um, group of rooms that you can move into and, and that would disappear maybe after you were out of them. Um, and that's to me what writing um, and uh, writing as collection, collecting cats, uh, writing as collection does or can do um, is allow you to follow something from room to room and open up the space uh, to find something new. Um, so thanks for listening. Um, thanks to Meekling Press, um, who you should continue to patronize these um, distance learning uh, lectures and readings and Hoedowns are amazing, and um, I look forward to seeing the next one, and I hope you do too. Thank you.